Hello and welcome to Reptiles and Research. So to look after your very first Mexican black king snake and to do it well, you need to get this foundational beginner's knowledge under your belt. My recommendations for how I think you should keep them come from the years of keeping them myself, working with them in stores and breeding them a few times as well. So let's go into tank size. So the minimum size tank you want for an adult Mexican black king snake is an enclosure that is the length of the snake. So if you've got a four foot king snake, then you want an enclosure or a terrarium that is four feet and in the internal dimensions of the enclosure so that your animal can stretch out and stretch its spine. I regularly see them like stretched out across my vivariums with their backs like loosely just like stretched out. So make sure that your enclosure is big enough to accommodate this. If we think about how much space they would use in the wild, not only can they stretch out in the wild, but they can travel around hectares of land that would be their territory sizes and traverse like a multiple lengths of themselves daily. So for us to give them a minimum ability to even stretch their spine out, I don't really think that's that far-fetched. I think it's probably quite reasonable. They can get just bigger than four feet, with most reported around three feet. But to be honest, most of them that I've come across have been four feet. Every single adult I've owned, um, bearing in mind it's only been three, but they've all been four feet, males and females. I like to use the rule of the length of the snake as the enclosure length and then half deep and then half high. So if you've got a four foot snake, that's a four by two by two vivarium. What I would say as a piece of advice is expect your snake to get to four feet and then buy a four foot vivarium. And if your snake ends up being shorter than that, great. You've got even more room for your snake. It's a win-win. And don't limit yourself to what is the minimum. You can go even bigger if you want to. I actually have some seven foot vivariums on order. So that the, the entire length, this entire wall are going to be one enclosure of each and every animal in this room. Every animal is going to have a seven foot vivarium. It's going to be incredible. So don't limit yourself. They will use the space. They won't get lost in there. They have several hectares of land and acres of land that have per animal's territory in the wild like we're not actually giving them that much as pets in our homes, so they're not going to get lost in there. You can buy your 4x2x2 by two by two enclosure for as little as $299 in the US right now. Custom Reptile Habitats have some incredible 4x2x2 by two by two enclosures with the perfect little basking spot case if you put all your lights in this one spot and the rest of it can be shade. It's perfect. I really like it. I think they're going to do very well with these. For babies, what you can do is house them in exoterra glass terrariums and then make sure that the vent along the back for wiring is stuck across and they can't nose it open. You can either do that by like silicon or glue, gluing it shut or some some tack on the other side so they can't slide it across. And then that's a really good enclosure for a, like a little baby king snake. You can put them in the little fornariums like I do for hatchlings, but you really want to work your way up to having this larger enclosure for an adult king snake. Now, before I go into all the heating and lighting for care for king snakes, I want to address the old school way of thinking with like the king snakes are scared of light and they're like light phobic when they're absolutely not. And actually, we, we, we break this down in a really logical and biological manner. It's actually quite illogical. So let's break this down. So melatonin is the hormone in us that makes us sleepy at night because we're diurnal animals. But on the flip side, if an animal is nocturnal, melatonin gives them energy. So we both use the same hormone, but it does the opposite for both of us. So when light hits our eyes as diurnal mammals, it blocks the melatonin production and that blocking of that makes us wake up. But in the reverse, the light hitting the, the eyes of a nocturnal animal stops them creating melatonin. And because the melatonin for a nocturnal animal gives them activity, gives them energy and makes them go to sleep during the light time. So we use light and this cycle of stopping off melatonin production in the exact same way. We're just following the reverse scripts. They're getting energy from melatonin. We're getting sleepy from melatonin. My point being is light is still their cue to when to even be nocturnal and when to even sleep. Light's the cue to make them act appropriately as per their biology. So once you know that, the notion that nocturnal animals should sit in perpetual darkness is actually quite an illogical premise. If there's no light upon them and they're not experiencing light, then there's nothing to trigger and stop the production of melatonin to make them sleep and act in a nocturnal fashion. They're simply just sat in the dark. And hormonally, what are those animals going to look like compared to those that have a set day and night schedule and a really healthy pattern? 
this notion of keeping them in perpetual darkness just because they're nocturnal is no different from looking at us being diurnal animals and then being like, oh, so therefore we have to have lights on 24-7. Could you imagine if we never got darkness to sleep? That's effectively what's happening to nocturnal species when, never, when we're never giving them light to sleep. When you think about it in that way, it's so ridiculous that that's even what we're doing but that's an old school way of thinking and we need to move past that now so i just want to address that so we can have that foundation there and we can move on from it because you're going to hear loads of old school stuff about king snakes and we really want to move forward from that it's 2023 <laughs> so regardless of what it is crepuscular nocturnal diurnal just provide them with a day and night cycle all you have to do is give them a day and night and no matter what it is you're keeping they will act accordingly as per their biology you don't have to do any sort of like fine tuning as to what you think it should do just give it its day and night cycle and the animal will do what it's supposed to do as a general rule, you want to put your lights on for 12 hours a day. Um, but realistically, during the year, you want to sort of like change how long the lights are on for to match your seasonal day length wherever you're living so that it's not out of balance from like the light coming through the windows and stuff. But yeah, you just want to come on in the morning and go off at night, essentially. And what the length of time that is, is kind of variable in what you're trying to achieve. For the most part, the general rule is 12 and 12. Now that that foundation is in place, let's talk about heating. Mexican black king snakes do like it quite cool and i know that's kind of contrary to what you might think of them being these arid desert dwelling animals but actually when you look at their habitats down um in the northwest of mexico it's actually quite green and quite lush in some places so this perception of it being like barren deserts and stuff the habitat really isn't like that and it might be in some cases in some spots but it doesn't mean they're restricted to just like a little sandbox it's not like that so what I recommend is a cool end temperature that goes down to sort of like 20 degrees or like 68 Fahrenheit. And then what you want to do is have a warm spot on the other side of the enclosure at sort of like 27 degrees to 30 degrees Celsius, which is uh, 80 to 86 Fahrenheit. So in the wild, they can find logs to be under and some rocks to be under in some grass. This really complex environment. They can be in an insulated spot and have nice like belly heat in in between some rocks or they can be fully exposed or partially exposed and like warm up via sunlight so in our homes as pets at a really basic level you can provide them with a heat mat or under tank heater whatever you want to call it connected to a thermostat to give them that little warm spot for them to like sit on and get that belly heat from and this is fine it allows them to digest and warm up and go about their day but what i like to recommend is a heat lamp because not only is it top down and more natural but it can do everything that you can get from a heat mat and more so you can get the belly heat by using a heat mat by like how you decorate underneath it so if you put a heat lamp onto something then the snake can go under that something and be warmed up by the object that's been warmed by the heat lamp but the actual rays that are coming out of a heat lamp are more akin to sunlight than any other lamp that we use so it has loads of healing properties and antimicrobial properties and there's so much more they get from it just from like digestion and warming up so i really like to provide them with a heat lamp i think it's a really good option so if you put decor underneath your heat lamp it can be under something get that belly heat or it can be up top and it can get open sun basking just like the complexity of the environment in the wild those two options are there ideally if you have a big enough enclosure you can give them both you can give them a heat mat connected to a thermostat in one spot under a hide so they have their nice little warm spot to go into many herpers find them under bits of tin or rubbish or boards they place out that have been baked by the sun so underneath it's nice and warm and they've got their backs pressed against the top of that and they get nice to warm and get like the belly heat but back heat and that thigmothermy in that way you can do the same in captivity by just giving them that heat mat and the hide and then over in at the end as well, they have their sunspot and everything I just said. So providing both options just gives them a really thermally complex environment. Again, I understand it's expensive and you're, you're buying a heat lamp and a thermostat and then a heat mat and then a thermostat. So if you can only do one, I would recommend the heat lamp because you can get the belly heat out of just the way you decorate beneath it rather than just going for a heat mat. Just make sure that you're not overheating the environment and you're taking away their cool spots because these snakes really appreciate their cool spots just as much as they appreciate the ability to have warm spots and warm up. Again, the bigger the enclosure you have, the bigger it is and obviously the wider the thermal gradient you can get and the more options you can play with. It gets easier to have big gradients 
the bigger the enclosure gets. At night time you can turn everything off, heating and lighting included. This nighttime drop in temperature is really good for their immune systems and it's really good for their health. So it's good for their health and it's good for you not wasting money on electricity at night when you don't need to. So let's talk about UV. So obviously Mexican black king snakes can survive without UV. We can't deny that. Many people have bred them for generations without ever even getting a lick of UV. So the premise of they can actually survive and not only breed without UV is very much documented. However, it is very good for them. It has never been studied in Mexican black king snakes specifically, but other studies in similar species like corn snakes showed that when they gave them UVB, their vitamin D levels in their blood rose, which greatly improves their health. When reptiles make vitamin D in their bodies through UV, when they have enough they have this, let's call it a fill line of vitamin D in their body. They stop production, they stop making more, so they don't get overdosed, essentially. So if we consider this upper line, this upper fill line, their optimal levels, this is where we should see them being, right? Now, we previously thought that snakes got all they need in terms of vitamin D from their food, right? So if we were to do these studies and see their vitamin D levels change, if they're already near the top of the fill line and they don't make any more because it stops off, so you should just see a little like topping off, right? Or even just like it doesn't change much at all because they should be already at optimal levels. So why then in this corn snake study did their vitamin D levels increase by 211%? My argument here is there is no way they, they could have been near the optimal levels before because there's no way, how how can they 200% when they were supposed to be already here, right? It doesn't make sense. So clearly they didn't have optimal levels of vitamin D before. So they must have been very low in vitamin D without UVB, which shatters what we previously thought. And yes, this is corn snakes and not king snakes. But what if I tell you that the same thing happened with Burmese pythons and it increased 500%. So I think all of us would agree that a Burmese python is less related to a corn snake than a king snake, and a king snake is very much more related to a corn snake than a Burmese python. So if this is present across not only the colubrid in terms of the corn snake, but also the python in terms of the Burmese python, then I think it's very, very likely that the king snake does it as well. It's just that it hasn't been studied in king snakes yet and been absolutely for definite specifically confirmed in this species, but I think it's very, very probable. So logically, why wouldn't we provide it to them? What, what's the worst that's going to happen? If it turns out in five years' time they make uh, this paper comes out and says, actually, it does nothing, then we'll be like, oh, I, I provided UV all this time and it didn't really do anything. Oh, well. Whereas the opposite is, oh, man, like... <laughs> I've not provided UV all this time and the studies come out and saying they need it. So I've literally like neglected to give that to them for like all this time. I feel so terrible. Whereas if you just give it to them and give it the benefit of the doubt, like, yeah, you're like, I've always done that. Cool. You know, like I know I picked, I picked it. I give them UV and they use it a lot. I see them regularly basking and getting really close um, above the substrate and above decorations and, like draping out long under the UV, they really do bask. So um, they they clearly seem to value it and are motivated to like bask underneath it. So I definitely provide it. So what I recommend is giving a UVB bar to one third of the length of the, of the enclosure to two thirds, or or just half maybe, just so that you have like the UV with your heat on one side, and then the other side is like shaded and cooler. So they would have this patch of sunlight and heat but also this shaded area that's quite cool. So we're given this like patch of sun and then shade, which is quite a natural way of doing it. And if they really don't want to be under UV, they don't need to be. They can just move out of it or even just under decorations. The last thing you can do is provide some visible lights. So in terms of the sun, I can break it down simply and say you have your infrared portion of sunlight, your UV, and then you have your visible light, right? So we've provided our heat lamp, which does the infrared portion of sunlight, and then we've provided our UV, and what's left is just, just to provide the visible light spectrum, just to fill out what we, we see in sunlight. So you can give them an LED that's full spectrum across the same way that you did the, the UV one third to half and allow them to come in and out of it. I mean, that's optional. If you were just gonna go for heat lamp and UV, I would say 
you're pretty much golden. But if you want to go further, if you're going to do anything like a bioactive in the future, not only is the, the LED good for them, but it's good for the plants. So let's go into substrate. So substrate's really good for getting them to to perform behaviors that they're motivated to perform. So like digging, essentially. So I roughly consider the substrate doing two things for king snakes. One, it allows them to root around and dig, but also it allows them to access a humid microclimate. So what you can do is offer them a dry substrate like aspen shavings or lignocell or pine shavings, and then just provide them with a humid hide, which is like a tub with a hole in it and some sphagnum moss stuffed in there. Or you can do like sandy soils mixes and more natural substrates, but have like moisture at the bottom so they can dig down to that. And that's very natural as well. Both options work for them in captivity. You've got to make sure that they can dig, but then access a human microclimate, either in the soil or as part of a humid hide. As long as that's provided, you're good to go. So let's go into decoration. So what I recommend is give loads of hiding opportunities along the back wall. I ideally like them to be able to move along the thermal gradient along the back wall without being seen. So then they have to choose between, oh, I want this spot of warmth, but I want security. So I'm not going to go over and traverse this big open gap over here to access this spot. I think they should have access to everything in terms of temperatures and humidity whilst having the security they want per se. So I like to bank it all towards the back, make sure there's like a corridor at the back that they can move without being seen, provide lots of like cork flats for them to get under and have their back pressed against like they would under a board or something in the wild, provide lots of logs and decorations and hides for them to get in, under, on, behind, just make a really dynamic environment. And then I would say provide them with some climbing opportunities, at least once to have the opportunity to lift their body fully off the floor and that is good exercise for them good exercise from climbing they're really using these muscles and they get really lean and muscular if they just sat there and they have no opportunity to use these muscles they can get a bit dumpy again i would place a flat rock beneath your heat lamp and then some like just clutter above it so they can get under or stick their tail out under the heat lamp or be partially exposed or fully exposed and just make sure you've got like those options there for them in terms of humidity, you don't really need to worry as long as it's not like some sweaty environment and there's always water running down the walls and everything from, from like condensation, you'll be you'll be fine. So sort of like 50% humidity during the day. I mean, even if it's higher, this room in, at the moment is like 70%, but there's a difference between humidity and wetness. So at the moment, again, like I told you, it's 70% humidity in here right now, but everything around me is bone dry. And that's the difference between humid and wet so it's just in the air so they can handle the humidity just fine um make sure their environment's just basically dry like i say and you'll be fine give them a large water bowl that's big enough for them to curl up in and soak in and then give them the humid hide and that's pretty much the humidity and water you really need to do it's pretty simple in terms of that in terms of diet, you can give them a variety of foods. They're opportunistic generalists so you can mix and match the diet and give them birds uh frogs legs quail chicks mice rats gerbils hamsters multi-mammoths you can really give them a varied diet because that's what they evolved to be opportunistic generalists with babies you can give them a pinky mouse every five days and then moving on to sort of like every 10 days coming to sub-adult and adulthood and i generally just switch between every five days for like babies and then switch it to every 10 days and that's how i keep my adults on as well you might have trouble sourcing some variety in the sizes that are small enough so you might have them on like a monoculture diet of just pinkies until they get bigger then you can bring in some like quail chicks or maybe some quail eggs as they get bigger and the variety can come as they get larger and are able to take some of these options that we have i wouldn't give them just a diet solely of just mice yeah they can do well on it and they can survive but variety is the spice of life and they are eating a variety diet in the wild to so give them like a variety and cycle it um, it's more fun to see them eat different things and how they approach to eat different things more fun for you and very enriching and better for the nutrition for the snake as well for adults anything sort of the size of an xl mouse that's like big enough to create like a small bulge in them so if you take the largest portion of your snake and then say like the same width of prey item or even slightly bigger they'll be able to swallow that no problem so that sort of size every sort of like 10 days Again, it's not a hard and fast rule. If you notice that your king snake's acting really hungry and coming forward like food, 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 what you can do is decrease the days and go every seven days. And then if they start putting on weight, 
then you can be like, okay, they're getting fat now. I'll go back to 10 days or even 14 days. Basically, you could find the sweet spot for your own individual snake's metabolism. There's no hard and fast rules. Some snakes can just eat like a pig and never gain weight. And some snakes are very funny where like if you overfeed a little bit, they pack on the weight a lot. So you need to find your sweet spot. And honestly, it's not a big deal. It can be far more fluid than this, but I know for beginners you want regime and to be told what to do. So I would say stick with that every 10 days and then go back and forth, whether it's losing weight or gaining weight or hungry, just like I said. So let's talk about brumation. So in the wild, these snakes will hibernate. So in captivity, we should let them do the same. Some people don't and just go as per as usual, the same temperatures all year round. And their snakes can even breed like that as long as the temperatures don't go too high to kill the male sperm. Um, typically, people have had success doing that. But there might be the possibility that brumating and hibernating extends their lifespan. So when some rat snake studies getting down into these lower temperatures and being able to hibernate, extended their lifespan for right up to a third. So it's not been studied in the Mexican black king snake, but the possibility is there. So if you can, I would recommend brumating. By mid-October, I would feed their last meal and then feed them nothing, keep temperatures and everything the same until the end of October. The reason for this, you don't want them to go into hibernation with food still in their stomach because they can get ill from it. And it's just, we just make sure that they clear their stomachs out. So on November 1st, I would reduce their day period from 12 hours down to eight hours of, of lights during the day and reduce their temperatures down to sort of like 25 degrees Celsius or like 77 Fahrenheit on the basking spot. So you allow that cool end to go even further into the cool. By mid-November, I would reduce the day period down to five days and I basically just let the temperatures go as cool as I can and basically just turn it off. At the end of November, what I would do is take the snake out, place it into a tub with substrate, a hide and a water bowl, place them in there and get them ready for hibernation. Now you want to place them in this tub somewhere where the temperature is going to be relatively stable and around sort of like 10 degrees Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit. That could be the concrete floor in your basement. That could be a garage. That could, for me, it could be the attic. If you don't have all those options, what you can do is place them in a refrigerator and place them, set the refrigerator at 10 degrees, obviously, and open that door and open their tubs for airflow ever so often. The snakes are absolutely fine like that. They go semi-dormant and they'll go into a hibernation-like state. And then what we do, we do the reverse coming into spring. The temperatures will generally rise in the environments we're placing them in, let them slowly come out, bring the tubs upstairs, or out of this cool place you've got them in, let them come to your room temperature, let the temperatures rise, let them be like that for a couple of days, put them, put them back in their enclosure, and then do the reverse, and then bring the day periods back up, and then slowly bring the temperatures back up. Some people just switch the full temperatures on, on day one, and just switch it all on. Um, I like to be a bit more gentle, but well, as your oyster, you can do either method, really. In terms of handling, I do choice-based handling. So if the snake says to me, I don't want you touching me, if it's rattling or it's like musking, it's very, very stressed. So I back off and I just, I say, okay, you don't want to be touched. And that is like a, a method that I use. I also use lots of training to get them to cooperate on their own care and move to where I want them to move to so I don't actually have to forcibly move them. But that is some advanced techniques that won't be in the scope of this video. This is very much foundational skills to get you caring for your Mexican black king snake. I will be making many more Mexican black king snake guides in the future. So if you're interested in that, remember to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.